Now that we've learned about the definition of an inductive Bible study, what is a method that we can use to actually do one? That's what we're going to talk about today. The object of the Bible is not to tell how good men are, but how bad men can become good. Dwight L. Moody. He's a Bible translator, I think. So today we're going to continue our conversation about the inductive Bible study. We want to talk about how we can interpret the Bible for ourselves and what it is using this method, which I believe is one of the most used methods of interpreting the Bible or reading Bible studies. I think we try in most of our small groups and things to go through it with a fresh eye, fresh opinions, and take a look at it. Most people don't go into a Bible study saying, okay, I'm going to read this book because I have determined Job is horrible and I'm going to prove this book says Job is horrible. We go into it saying we're going to learn about Job and we're going to figure out exactly what it is Job does, says, his friends say. We have a fresh view of it, right? That's how most Bible studies go. I worked for InterVarsity and I said before I was a brand new Christian at the time. And a lot of people there were very interested in getting me into Bible study. They understood that I didn't know a lot. I was, I don't know, maybe a year in from becoming a Christian. And so some of them gave me different kinds of Bibles that were good for studies. They gave me study guides. I walked out of there with a complete set of the InterVarsity Bible study pamphlets, a lot of books in there. And one person even gave me a Bible in a binder that has no chapters and verses in it at all and said a code language of circling different words and highlighting other words for a Bible study. But there's all sorts of ways you can go about doing it. But I think this inductive method might give us a good starting point and then we can get all fancy. Maybe in seven and a half years when I'm done with the Bible in small steps, I'll do something fancier. I don't know. But this is a very good, solid way to go when you're looking for a way to study the Bible. So he said that there's going to be certain steps. And he says these steps are begin with, again, that observation. We talked about that last week, which means what did we see? What was the actual thing we read? Then the next part of it is interpretation. What does this mean? And then we end with the application. What does it mean for me? Was Jesus talking to a specific person at a specific time about a certain thing? Or is he telling all of us that we should share the gospel with the word, that we should trust in God, that we should pray in God? Are these lessons for us too? And we're going to keep going, he says, through these steps of observation, interpretation, and application every time we go. And I tried to do it in my Bible study a little bit with my Ramps Bible study, which is a sheet you can download. It is a question sheet that goes through this formula of what I call ramps, which is read. That's going to be our observation. A, for analyze, or what they call interpretation. And then application, which comes in the, I'm going to meditate on, I'm going to pray about, and I'm going to share with others. This is the real application of what I'm reading. So it follows that same path with it. I just called it ramps. Because I did a Bible study a number of years ago with my church that I called the RPMs on our Route 66 through the Bible. You see all that car thing going on there? I decided not to do the car thing and instead make it ramps. It's our ramps up to God by observing, interpreting, and then applying the Bible. He says, quote, observation seeks to establish a foundational knowledge of what the text is saying. We want to understand exactly what it is. What is the actual words? We got caught up, you know, in the parables when we were talking about Matthew, where it said the seed of a mustard plant grows into a giant tree and the birds like to nest in the tree. And boy, if you look at some of the commentaries about that parable, well, the birds represent the Pharisees and Satan trying to steal the seeds of the tr mustard tree and destroy the tree. And I'm going, really? I mean, I don't read anything like that. I don't see anything like that. And then when I was looking at the People's Bible, which I've happened to really liked in this whole Bible study process, it said, hey, don't do such a deep dive into these parables. Just get the meaning of what he's saying, that something very tiny grows into a healthy tree. And it's so healthy, it can have birds in it. Oh, yeah, that makes more sense. I understand that. Okay, cool. You know, so. 
you're going through this process, I think it's important that you do these methodical steps, but you also try to do it in context with what's being said, what kind of structure it has. In this case, that was a parable. And that way you can then move on to the next part, which is the interpretation, which is trying to understand the meaning of it. Do we get wrapped up in every single word, like the birds in the tree nesting? Or do we say, oh, that's just a sign of a healthy tree. That's all that is. Interpretation, I think, is a little bit harder. But I think if we do a good job, this is what I'm finding in the Bible in small steps. If we do a great job at observing, the interpretation gets a lot easier. Make sure that you actually read instead of just kind of have your eyes glaze over. Read what was actually there, and then the next part will be better. And then he says that, you know, when you're interpreting, you can look at other places in the Bible that told a similar story. Again, using the Bible to interpret the Bible. You can study the roots, the culture, what this phrase meant, why they would say, look at the coin of Caesar and whose face is on it. Oh, that's going to be Tiberius Caesar because that's whose face is on the coin. Then looking at the history that Jerusalem at the time of Jesus was occupied by Romans and how the Pharisees were trying to get Jesus in trouble with Rome. Then we can really understand the story because now we looked at the history, the culture, all those things. And then he says the application part is multifaceted because we're going to try to get the idea about whether this is an us thing or it's a them thing. <laughs> is it something that they were supposed to do? That's how we're going to take off from the interpretation now and say, what does this mean right now? What does this mean for me? What does it mean for my church? He gives the example of greeting each other with a holy kiss. We don't greet each other with a holy kiss in church. Sh should we be? But instead, we understand that it was a sign of brotherly love at that time. We don't normally go around and kiss each other, at least in the United States, particularly at church. Instead, it's saying you should greet each other. You should be a community together, you know, and so you'll be able to find ways that are equivalent to giving each other a holy kiss, maybe without giving each other a holy kiss. I thought that was a really good example of it. Or maybe we should kiss at church. I don't think so. But maybe as we're looking at the text and trying to figure out what it means for me, what it means for my church, that's essentially what he says it means to do theology, whether it's biblical or systematic. I'm not going to go into this types of theology, but when we sit there and determine what it is we should be doing, that's where we get into the theology of it. So when the early church was handling snakes and healing people, does that mean we should be handling snakes and healing people? Now, major denominations are based on that question. When Jesus says, let the little children come to me, does that mean we should introduce children to Jesus? Or does it mean we should also baptize them? Boy, there's a whole other denomination right there. So that's where he's talking about in the theological sense. That's the part where we're actually bringing practical life methods from the Bible to us. And he said that one of the nice things about the inductive piece is that we're trying to rip out the meaning, not rip out, but grab the meaning from the scripture. But he says that we should have order and structure because the Bible is very ordered and structured, but also some flexibility and understand there's some dynamic steps between things. For example, I, I thought of this when he said this part. Jesus goes and tells the apostles that their church is going to be like yeast and flour, where suddenly it was tiny and small, and it ballooned into a gigantic church. But then it turned around the next time and talked about yeast of the Pharisees and how it was going to spoil everything. Why would you throw those two yeast things together? But I think he's talking about good yeast and bad yeast, you know, that just like the church is going to grow from tiny little seeds, bad things can grow from tiny little seeds too. Watch out for it. So that's where we have to have a little bit of flexibility instead of saying leaven is always bad or leaven is always good. Nope. Can't look at it that way. Sometimes birds are looked negatively in the Bible, but sometimes in the case of the mustard seed, it was a sign of a healthy tree. So that kind of flexibility is important.
He says then, too, we can use what he calls the personal approach. And I think this is where it always gets very difficult, because when we're looking at the Bible, clearly when I'm doing the Bible in small steps, I come from a very poor background. But my experience of the Bible goes through that same pathway of my experiences, who I am as a person. I come from an agricultural area. So I dig the agricultural parables probably more than someone from the city. People from the city will really dig all the places where the cities are talked about as places of excitement, thought evolution, where things happen. They may enjoy that more because they're really into city things. So our individual experiences are also going to take into account how we interpret the Bible. But this is where I think it's kind of nice to do Bible studies together because we have different perspectives. Like I did the book, Sourcing the Divine, where she went and talked to actual farmers about keeping sheep, growing wine, growing fruit, and growing honey. What does it actually mean to do that? How does it actually change farming based on what Jesus said? Our different experiences are going to allow us a different taste of the Bible. And I think that adds to the richness, it can add to the confusion too. But he says that we should always still bring our practical side to it and allow what he calls shortcuts as time constraints may demand. We get the idea. You know, I can't go on an hour per podcast and talk about a particular chapter or all of you would leave. So I have to be able to say, we all get right that he is telling the Pharisees they got this wrong. Shortcut. <laughs> so, and then he says that the inductive method should be beneficial. It should encourage our skills, our studying, that we should learn more. And I find too, now that the more I'm doing this, the better I'm getting at it. I think I'm getting at it. And so it also should be beneficial to us in our actual study of the Bible. And he says at the end that if we do all these things and we work on our inductive Bible study methods, quote, we'll be well on our way to hearing God's well done, good and faithful servant with regards to our study of the scripture. No one prays harder that I can do a good job on that podcast than I do because it's really scary to do this podcast. But I hope that by praying and being honest with the word that it comes through in that. And I think that if you were to go through and start doing your own inductive Bible study, you'll get a lot out of it too. This book, I think, is really good. And I think if you're looking to learn more about how to study the Bible, it is a little bit on the scholarly side, but it's lots of good information. Give some advice about how you can go about observing and interpreting, that you should allow observations to be a starting point for your interpretations. That's going to where you're going to start off from. This is what I literally read. Then when we go into interpreting, he says, don't limit yourself to the general issues of content, meaning sometimes you have to move deeper. You have to actually look at the quality of what's being said, that it shouldn't just necessarily revolve only around the content but instead should give us a meaning when we're trying to interpret it. What is the meaning of what's being said? So sometimes you'll talk about like the passage of divorce. The passage is about how serious marriage is and that it was meant to be forever. The point of the story was that the Pharisees were saying something very shallow to him. Oh, you're not washing your paws or you're not doing this, or you're not doing that. But look at you, you're divorcing your wives for silly things, because they don't cook you a good dinner, because they're not pretty anymore, because you met somebody else. So even though the passage itself is about divorce, the bigger picture is you are being hypocritical, Pharisees. That's the bigger issue of it. And I think that's what he's getting at about where you just don't stick to the content, but you look at the bigger meaning of what's going on. And then he says simple questions. Who, why, what, where, how many? There's always what, to what extent? Those are the questions that every good student learns when you're in grade school about when you're trying to understand something. You're trying to be a reporter. That led me off to trying to always explain who are we talking to? Who was the listener of the story? What is happening? Where is it happening at? Why does he tell the Canaanite woman that she can tell whoever she wants, but he tells the Jerusalem people to keep quiet about him? Well, it's because of the proximity of Jerusalem. And he doesn't want to get the heat 
that the Pharisees and primarily the Sadducees in government are going to put on him. And then he says there's always broad questions, the intent and the purpose of the particular passage. And then we're going to look at our knowledge of the rest of the Bible, our knowledge of God, our knowledge of Peter, our knowledge of Jesus, and everything else we've learned up to that point to help us interpret it. And then he says, allow your own knowledge of biblical and theological issues to influence you. So again, it's not deductive where we're going to start with the point and work backwards, but it still has an influence in how we interpret the Bible and how we see what we see. But he says in the end, interpretation questions are just asking questions, trying to figure out what's going on. I think our questions are so important when it comes to Bible study because it's going to help us dig deeper. It's going to help us drive. And I think even when we look at the Gospels, you'll notice that Jesus is mad at the questions of the Pharisees because they're trying to trick him. But he's never mad at the questions of the apostles because they're trying to honestly learn. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to go into this Bible study not as a trap to prove that God is some horrible creature that we should run away from. I've seen people study the Bible like that before. In fact, I live in Ground Central for that. Instead, we're going to come to God honestly, with honest questions and trying to learn honest answers. I think that's the kind of relationship God wants to have with us. And in the last parts of the book, talk about different ways of interpretation. We talked a little bit about that last week. But I like this passage that was talking about scripture interpreting scripture. He says that there's 66 books. They're written over thousands of years with different histories, different locations, all these different authors and motifs and everything. But you know what? There is a single message out of the whole thing. That's what makes it amazing, that this is God's rescue plan for us, that he is coming to save us. And this is the pattern he's going to take. And that we can look at the Bible as that entire spread. And sometimes when we wonder, why was Rahab, a prostitute in Jericho, mentioned? Why was Ruth in the Bible? And then you find out, oh, they are going to be the grandmothers of Jesus. Wow. So we learn in this whole context of history that we can do what they say, connect the dots of the scriptures, take the prophets, take the meanings of all the times that Israel was seized, all the times they were brought back, all the times they had good kings and bad kings, and bring it all together in this thematic story of Jesus' rescue to us. And then it says we have to realize that interpretation, observation, (laughs) We need the Holy Spirit, and we should pray to the Holy Spirit before we start our Bible study so that he can offer us what they say is illumination in this process, and that we can understand what's going on through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and that we invite him into this process of inductive Bible study. I didn't really know what that meant until I started doing the Bible study podcast, and then I pray that the Holy Spirit is with me and helps me in this process. It also requires, it says, sharp thinking, a true application, and being able to find the right resources that would help me to understand it. Boy, prayer and asking for the Holy Spirit to be present, I can't even think of better advice than that. So my challenge to you is now that we talked about the inductive Bible study method, Try again to read another very small passage, maybe just a couple of chapters, maybe your favorite story in the Bible, and see if you can do this three step method of observation. You can even write it on a paper like this What am I seeing in this passage? What would a normal human being, what would aliens from Mars see when they read this passage? Go into the interpretation phase. What does it mean? And then What is the bigger story here? And then what is the application to our lives too? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you going with me on this adventure of Bible study. I wanted to give you the tools so that you too could start your own Bible study and do so in a really successful way. But hopefully this four-part series on how to study the Bible in a very solid way will help you in your studies of the Bible. Like I said, this book, 
took a person who didn't know how she was going to do a podcast about the Bible and gave me the footing, hopefully do something really profound with that Bible study. And I'm not saying I'm profound. I'm saying that the footing is profound. (laughs) So thank you very much for listening. Remember that you can always keep me in your prayers and I will keep you in my prayers too. And if there's anything I can pray for you about, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com or I'm even on Twitter and the Twitter links are in the show notes. You can DM me if you wish. But if anything I can pray for you about or anything that I could do as a topic, I would love to hear about it. And remember, our dive through interpreting the Bible starts with small steps 